Hey now folks, my name is Nick, and today we are taking a look at Mice and Mystics from Plaid Hat Games, designed by Jerry Hawthorne. Now, Plaid Hat Games is a company that I really admire, and I've been following them for a while now, because they do very thematic games that tell a story. I reviewed Summoner Wars, and I just love it, and even though that's really just a tactical card game, there's so many flavorful things, and there's a background story to it, and all the different factions are, are very different and thematic in how they work, that I really feel like I'm playing an actual battle, like I'm telling a story. Other games from them that I've played, I've liked some more than others, but they all have that same sort of storytelling aspect, and Mice and Mystics is really the epitome of that. This game has been tremendously popular, probably their most popular game, or maybe neck and neck with Summoner Wars, but it always sells out every time there's a print run. It's very popular with families, people who have kids, uh, people who like role-playing games but want something a little bit lighter, condensed down into a board game box, this is really the game for them. Now, what is it? Essentially, like I said, it's a storytelling game. You're playing through the chapters of a book that comes with the game, and the story revolves around a group of humans in sort of a medieval fantasy world who are advisors to a king who has fallen ill because of the evil predations of this sorceress named Venestra and her army of black-clad warriors. And they're, you're, you as the advisors are thrown into jail and the wizard in your party has to transform you all into mice to escape the prison. But turning back into humans is not so easy and you basically have to go through a series of adventures to try to uh, save the kingdom, get back to your normal selves. And I don't want to spoil too much more than that because frankly I haven't played through every chapter. But And I don't want to spoil anything anyways. But that's basically the game. And like I said, it's an RPG light so you are going to... Uh, sort of cooperate together, work through these different challenges, roll dice, equip yourselves, get special abilities, and so on and so forth. So I already told you it's a very popular game, but is it going to be right for you? Is it going to be right for your friends, for your family, whoever you're interested in buying the game for? Well, we're going to go through a little brief overview of just the game mechanics and not the storyline itself, because I don't want to spoil anything. Then we're going to come back and I'll let you know what I think about it. Mice and Mystics is a cooperative game for one to four players, and even though it's not too complicated, there are a, little, a lot of little rules to keep track of, so I can't give you a comprehensive rules guide, but I can just give you a general overview to see if it's something that you might enjoy. Now, at the beginning of the game, the most important thing is to look through the two different books that come with the game. First, you have the base rule book, which is going to tell you all the game mechanics and how to actually play and set up the normal game. And there's also a video online that you can view from Watch It Play, which is pretty good. Um, and that's just telling you the general rules of the game. But perhaps the more important book is the story book, which in this case is called Sorrow and Remembrance. Now, um, among other things, this is going to contain the actual storyline of the game, starting with a prologue that you're actually supposed to read aloud or download a special uh, app that will let the narrator read it for you. And after you get through the actual storyline sections, it will give you the setup for the game itself. Each chapter is going to have different particular setups that uh, some and some rules that might override or contradict the base rules of the game. So this is always the first thing you should refer to when you're starting off a new game. Uh, once you've got that settled, then the character, the players who are in the game can choose one of the characters. And you can either do it randomly, you could do it, uh, have everyone choose. It just depends on whether or not you really want to continue forward through this through different scenarios in the so-called campaign mode. Now, not every character is going to be available at every given time because you are playing through a story and some characters haven't arrived yet. But you have characters like Tilda, the healer. You've got Filch, the rogue. You've got Nez, who's sort of the big brute warrior. You've got Maginos, the wizard, who's the person that actually turned you all into mice in the first place. Uh, you've got Lily, the archer, and Colin, the leader slash warrior. Um, and they all have their own different abilities and different stats. Up here, everyone's got the same four types of stats with different numbers. So you have combat, you've got defense, you've got lore, you've got movements. Um, then you have some sort of special ability. Uh, so for instance, Tilda's is that every time another mouse on the same tile gets poisoned, she gets a cheese for free. I'll explain all that in a moment. Everyone starts off with different starting equipment, which you're going to pull from this equipment deck at the beginning of the game and then reshuffle. And then everyone's got a certain amount of health that they can take before they get captured, which is this game's form of being killed or knocked out, essentially. Every time you get wounded, you'll take one of these little wounds tokens. If you're poisoned, you'll flip it over to the green side instead. And if you ever run out of, if you ever take too many of these, in other words, if, like if Tilda were to take three, she would be captured. 
Now, you also get to choose an ability card at the start of the game. Ability cards are basically special things that you can use once per turn, and uh, you have to pay cheese for them, which is sort of the currency of this game, and then you'll get a special effect. Now, these are class-specific, so you have to make sure that whatever character you chose can actually use it. So, Major Heal can only be used by a healer, of which Tilda is the only one. Some of them are more generic, so Battle Squeak can be used by a warrior, and there's two different warriors in the game, Colin and Nez, I believe. Uh, but basically they'll give you a special effect. Sometimes it takes your whole turn, like Major Heal requires an action to use, and uh, you can heal two wounds off of another player by spending two cheese, or one wound off of two different players. Um, Battle Squeak uh, does not require an action, but it does require one cheese, and it lets you add one to your die roll for a melee attack for the turn, and so on. During the course of the game, if you ever acquire six cheese, as a free action, you can spend all six cheese to grab another skill. Essentially, you're leveling up that way. Now, the other thing that you do in the game is after you do the starting setup, sometimes the guide will tell you to put specific fighters out there or specific enemy, they call minions, out there on the board. But if you get to a new tile and there's no specific setup, then you have to draw from the encounter deck, which is over here. There are difficult cards and standard uh, cards, but they all kind of look the same. You'll go to the encounter card and look and see what monsters come out. Now, what monsters come out, minions, excuse me, depends on where you are on the page count. This is like the little timer of the game. The scenario will tell you where to put the end marker. So for the first one, it's page six. And then you'll always start off at page one. So you're gonna to refer to this card and see what page you're on and that's what uh, minion comes out. So if this was a new tile in page one, five greedy roaches come out. If it was page four, a centipede and two elite rats would come out. And by the way, before I go too much farther, that's part of the cool part of this game are these awesome miniatures that come with the game for each particular different type of minion. See here the spider and the different rat warriors. And also, of course, each of the different characters that the players control comes with their own miniature as well, which all look really cool and I wish I had them painted. In any case, once you have uh, your starting setup and the players that you're gonna use, and whatever minions are gonna be on the board, then you set the initiative track. Each player in each different type of minion has their own initiative card, uh, which will give you, it's a little handy resource to have because it gives you the cheat sheet on what their stats, their base stats are, and their health. And for the monsters, it's very important because that'll give you their combat and their defense and also whatever special ability they have. So for instance, the rat warriors, Every time they come up in the initiative, after they're done, they get to move up one in the initiative. So at the beginning, you're gonna shuffle all of these up and you will deal them out on these spots on the board, starting from one and working your way down until every initiative card that's in, the, in this particular encounter has been used and put out there. And that determines the turn order each time. Now that may, like I said, with the Rat Warriors, that might change, that might become fluid, and you might actually get certain bonuses if you're first or last in the initiative order. So keep that in mind. So, down to the actual gameplay. Once you've determined what the initiative order is, you'll start. Uh, on a Mouse's turn, the player characters, that is to say, you have two things you can do. You can move and you can take an action. At the start of every turn, you're gonna roll one of these dice and try to find out what your movement is. Now these dice have a lot of symbols which we'll cover as we go along, but for movement, the most important one is a little tiny number, which might be hard to see up here in the top corner that ranges from one to three. You'll roll one die, take whatever number that is and add it to the movement stat on your card, and that's how many spaces you can move on your turn. The movement is very simple and intuitive. You can move diagonally, you can move one space per uh, movement that you have, and as long as your base can bridge a gap, you can move between those two spaces and move diagonally. As far as where you can end up, the mice are considered small, as are some of the rat warriors, the cockroaches, things like that, and small figurines can have four to a space. Now, if you move into an enemy space, you immediately have to stop. If you are trying to move out of an enemy space on a subsequent turn, then you have to, if, as long as there's only one other enemy in the space or that you have more compatriots with you, you can move out freely. But if there's ever any more enemies than there are mice, you can't move out of the space. Uh, once you've, now, you don't have to move first. You can choose to take your action first and then move. That's up to you. But you always have to roll first to determine how much potential movement that you have. After that, you can take your actions. And there's a number of different actions you can do. You can choose to scurry, which is to say you just move again, so you get to have a double move. You can choose to search. When you search, you're just gonna take any die and roll it and hope that you get one of these little star icons. It's a 50-50 shot. If you successfully roll a star icon, you get to take a treasure or a equipment from the equipment deck. Now, you can only successfully search once per tile uh, for the rest of the game. If you successfully search, you'll just take the top card off the deck. And some of them are one-time use items like disguises, 
Um, some of them are armor, like leather breastplate, which gives you a bonus, or the acorn helmet, which prevents you from being stunned. Um, a grape, catnip. Some of them are actually negative cards. So, for instance, you have poison cheese, which makes uh, the mouse receives a poison wound marker. There's another one that makes you lose all of your cheese, uh, moldy cheese, I believe it's called. So there could be bad events in there as well. You just have to kind of take that gamble. And then, of course, you can battle on your turn. To battle, you have to either be in adjacent, an adjacent square to a minion or in the same square as a minion if you have, are trying to make a melee attack. If you're trying to do a ranged attack, all you have to do is have a minion in line of sight. Now, if you're trying to make a melee attack, you're going to look at whatever your combat value is on your card. And you're going to add it to whatever bonuses you have from equipment, and then you're going to roll that many dice. Uh, when you're rolling dice for combat, the most important thing you're looking for are swords or swords and shields. Both of those will count as potential hits. If you roll cheese, either while attacking or defending, you immediately take a cheese token and put it in your stash. And like I said, cheese can be used to level up, to use special abilities, you can give it to other mice and so on. Now, if you're attacking from ranged, you're looking for the bow and arrow. If every bow and arrow counts as the same as a sword and shield for that type of attack, you're trying to get the most. If you don't get at least one hit with either type of attack, the defending, you have no chance of hitting, and the defending enemy does not have to roll a defense. If you do have at least one potential hit, then the, defend, the defense has to roll their dice. Whether it's a mouse player character or whether it's one of the minions, you both look at your defense value, which is the shield icon, and roll that many dice. Of course, there might be modifiers as well. And for that one, you're only looking for the sword and shield. That's the only thing that can block a potential hit. And of course, like I said, if you roll cheese, you get cheese, but it doesn't prevent a hit from going through. Each sword and shield cancels out one potential hit, and if there are no potential hits left after canceling them out, the hit does not go through. But if even one hit goes through, for every hit that goes through, you get a point of damage. For money minions, that means instant death, but some of the more powerful minions like spiders and centipede have more than one health box. For the mice, like I said, you're just trying to make sure you never reach your threshold of wounds or else you're going to get captured, aka knocked out. So uh, once you're done with that, uh, uh, well, I should mention also, for the minions, if they roll cheese on their defense or attack, something else happens. They take cheese, and instead of taking it in their personal stash, they put it on this section of this board up here called the minion wheel. Now, the reason that's a problem is that because if that minion wheel ever fills up with six slices of cheese, two things happen. First off, you have to move the page counter up on the board. The reason this is bad is that because if this page counter ever reaches the end of the track, the last page of the book, the game is immediately over and the players lose if they have not completed their objective by that point. The other bad thing is that a surge happens. So if this is a normal encounter and you have an encounter card that you've drawn for the turn, you're gonna look at whatever the surge part of the card is and do what it says. So in this case, a centipede comes out. When you put new minions on the board, there's these little feet patterns on the board, which is where you have to put the minions. And there's special rules for how uh, they're placed on the board in special circumstances if all those spots are taken. Uh, once, uh, so all the players are going to take their turns. If one of the minion spots comes up, then they take turns uh, sort of on autopilot, but similar to the characters. They roll a dice to see what their movement is, and they move as close to the mice as possible, moving into their square if possible as well. And then they're going to attack with whatever their attack value is and whatever, whatever special abilities they have as well. Now, there's a lot of different things with the terrain as far as the board. So some of these spots, um, you'll spend an action to explore. If there's a little flippy spot, then that, <laughs> so to speak, that's technical jargon. Once all the minions have uh, been eliminated, you can explore and you can actually flip the whole tile over. So and it's all very thematic. So in this case, there's a sewer grate. So if you flip that over, then you actually, you and your mouse compatriots drop down into the sewers and you'll start there in the board in the water. Now, once you do that, as long as there's like these different colored spots that match up on the board, as long as these spots, these colors are matching, you can go to the edge of the board, use the explore action again as your action for the turn, and move on to that tile as well. But remember that minions also have to be wiped out, even if it's just a normal explore action. Once you get to a new tile, you have to draw an, uh, an encounter card, unless there are special rules for the scenario from the storybook. And that's basically it. You're going to keep going through the game, trying to meet your objective, whatever that happens to be, uh, wiping out the minions, trying to level up, and trying to beat the clock of the pages turning. There's a lot of little extra stuff. There's like special achievement tokens that you can earn for doing certain things, like uh, rolling four, three or four cheese on a turn gets you the cheese master token. Uh, being poisoned too much gives you the poison master token. Um, which, but they can all give you extra benefits. There's little side quests, optional side quests you can get on to get 
other special achievements and renown. Uh, Brody the cat might attack, who's like the most powerful enemy in the game. Very, very annoying. You can get status effects like stun, web. There's a lot of little things to the game, a lot of little intricacies um, that make it not too complicated, but have a lot of different uh, facets to the game and things that make it interesting. And that's basically my Mystics. It's a very funny thing. When I think of Mice and Mystics, the first word that pops into my mind when I'm trying to struggle for how best to describe it is that it's welcoming. That can sound weird, but what I mean by that is that the game is just so welcoming to being played. It's just, you open that box. I mean, the box itself, beautiful artwork. The whole game is filled with beautiful artwork, but that's the first thing you see when you pick up the box and you see the back of the box and it's all just laid out very, very nicely. And then you open the box and you have these wonderful little miniatures that are just so well designed and so cute. And, uh, you know, it, it, they're just, it just, it's so cool looking. Um, and then you actually, the game boards are all laid out very nice. You have all these different game boards with different sides. And then you have the story book, which can feel intimidating at first, but then you open up the book and it's like reading a story and it tells you what parts to read. And then it, from there it goes right into the game mechanics and all that just feels very inviting. It's very accessible. And then even though the game mechanics can be, you know, the first time you play, if you're not used to role playing games and how those mechanics work or games like Descent or Hero Quest or things like that, it can be slightly intimidating. But once you get into it, it's actually very simple. So the whole game is just made to be accessible. And that's probably why it's such a big hit with families and with people that have children. Really, just to cut to the chase, it's a wonderful game. Now, I do come from a background where I play a lot of Dungeons and Dragons and other types of role-playing games, so I was probably pre-inclined to like this game. But the fact is, when you throw the whole package together with the components, with the artwork, with the storytelling, it really can create something unique. It sort of breaks away from the games that inspired it and sort of becomes its own thing. And, you know, like I said in the beginning, Plat Hat is sort of an expert at this, at making these sort of storytelling games. And I think with this one, they really hit it out of the park. And this is sort of the benchmark upon which all the other games will be judged upon. So let's talk about the mechanics a little bit. Like I said, it's very simple, um, but it can be a little steep learning curve to learn first. There's a lot of little rules as far as movement, line of sight. Um, these are all things that role-playing gamers are used to, but not necessarily casual board gamers who sort of Part of the reason why they're playing board games is they don't have to deal with all those little eccentricities of rules. But the rule book really helps lay this all out very simply. And integrated with the storybook, you know, there is some good integration there. So there's there's not a lot of hiccups as far as that goes. Um, the game can be difficult, uh, but not too difficult. I think that the difficulty is just about right. You will probably lose your first time uh, because you're gonna wanna do a lot of different things. You're gonna wanna try out all the different mechanics, but there is still sort of a timer in the game. And that's probably one of the aspects of the game that I like the most because um, it's very innovative how it works with the minion wheel and how if you, uh, if you sort of uh, waste too much time and uh, dawdle around too much, you're going to find yourself in a very serious bad situation with more and more monsters to fight and less time before you get to the end of the, so you run out of pages and get to the end of that chapter. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. A lot of people do not recommend going on the little side quests that they have until you're really familiar with the game because you might run out of time as much as you really want to. The game really emphasizes teamwork. That's another reason why I really suggest it uh, for kids and families as, you know, you're really working together to get through. Everyone has these different characters with these different powers and you have to find out how to use those powers best, not just to, you're not trying to win the game on your own, you really have to help out the other people. And some of the scenarios are difficult enough that you have to work together. No, one's, no one can be a hot shot and just run ahead and steal all the equipment. You have to share amongst each other, you have to work together, and it's just great and it works very thematically. The storyline is very cool, it's very unique, the theme is very well integrated to the mechanics and it helps with all the components like I've already mentioned. Um, all the characters are very charming and like I said, have their own different abilities and you have these options that you can use um, if you, you know, and you actually have the sort of campaign mode that you can go on as you go along. If you really enjoy the game and you want to stick with it with the same people, you have that option. You can take your character, take the equipment they've gained and the skills that they've learned and carry over to the different chapters. And that's a really wonderful thing that you don't get out of a lot of games. Some people are sort of turned off by that. Some people just want a simple board game experience that they can put down and play. They don't have to worry about the upkeep and remembering who played what. And maybe this game is not for them because this game really excels 
when you're playing that storyline mode. There's only so many times you're going to want to play the first scenario. Um, so that can definitely be a fault of the game. It's for a very specific audience of people who want to play a continuous storytelling game. The game also is not that deep of a game. Um, there are other cooperative games that offer a much deeper, broader experience um, and also a higher level of difficulty like Robinson Crusoe or Yggdrasil or games like that, which are very much more puzzly, much more brain burny. Um, so to speak, uh, that's definitely not what this game is about. So I think that traditional board gamers who just want heavy strategic Euro game, this is definitely out of their wheelhouse. But for the people who love theme, who love components, who love art, who love story, who love cooperative games working together, it's difficult to imagine a better game for them at this point because it really hits all of those different aspects and comes up with a wonderful presentation and package for them. So I really can't gush about it enough. Um, there's more expansions on the way. I can't really wait for those. So the game will be supported. Um, you're gonna have a lot more adventures to come and you'll definitely get a lot of longevity out of this game. Uh, Mice and Mystics, highest recommendation. So my name is Nick, this has been Board Game Brawl and I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day in every way. Take care.